Hi, this is Linda Green with a video on the second half of 14.7. We covered the first half in class last week. So I want to start with a little bit of review from the concepts we talked about last week in the form of two multiple choice questions. So please pause the video, think about your answers to the questions, and then resume. For the first question, you should have answered that if x not y not is a critical point, f may or may not have a local max or min. Just like in Calc 1, being a critical point does not guarantee you're a local max or min. Instead, the critical points are just the candidates for local max and mins. Those are the points you need to check when you're looking for a max or min. For the second question, suppose f has continuous first and second partial derivatives and x not y not is a critical point. If f sub x x at x not y not is positive, then you should have answered, there's not enough information to determine the behavior. Because f sub x x is positive, we know that f is concave up in the x direction. But in the y direction, it could be concave down, giving us a saddle point, or it could be also concave up, giving us a local min, or we could have some function like f x y equals x squared at 0, 0, fxx is positive, and yet, as we can see from the picture, at 0, 0, we don't have a local min or a saddle point. We have a different behavior. So there's not enough information to determine the behavior just from f sub xx, and in fact, there's not even enough if we just consider f sub yy. Instead, we have to consider the discriminant, which is f sub xx, f sub yy, minus f sub xy squared. And as we talked about last time, if the discriminant at x naught y naught is positive, and also f sub xx is positive at that point, then we can conclude f has a local min. And there are similar conditions for determining a saddle or a local max. That's the second derivative test for two variables. For our first example, I'd like to find the local maxes and mins for the following function. Let's start by finding the critical points. f sub x, I mean, sorry, f sub x is 2x plus 2xy, and f sub y is 2y plus x squared. Setting this both to 0, we can solve for x and y. So we see that either x equals 0 or y equals negative 1. Plugging into the second equation, if x is 0, we have to have y equals 0. And if x equals negative 1, sorry, if y <laughs> excuse me, I'm just getting used to this tablet here. If y equals negative 1, then we have to have that x is either plus or minus the square root of 2. That gives us three critical points to check. Let's look at the discriminant. f sub xx is 2 plus 2y. f sub yy is 2. And f sub xy is 2x. So therefore, the discriminant is 2 plus 2y times 2 minus 2x squared, which is 4 plus 4y minus 4x squared. If we evaluate the discriminant at 0, 0, we get 4, which is greater than 0. And in addition, 
f sub x x at 0, 0 is equal to 2, which is greater than 0, so we have a local min. If we look at the discriminant at negative 1 square root of 2, we get a value of negative 8, which is less than 0. And similarly, the discriminant of negative 1 negative square root of 2 is negative 8. So we have saddle points at these two points. We can verify this by looking at the graph. You can see that there seems to be a local minimum at 0, 0, and saddle points at the other two points marked. Next, I'd like to find the point on the plane with the given equation that's closest to the point 0, 1, 1. This might remind you of problems we did back in chapter 13, when we were talking about vectors, and we used vector projection to find the distance between points and lines or planes. But now we'll do this sort of problem using a different method of minimization techniques. So first let's write out the general formula for distance. If we have any point x, y, z, the distance between that point and the given point is just the square root of x minus 0 squared plus y minus 1 squared plus z minus 1 squared. Now we're going to find it easier instead of minimizing distance to minimize distance squared so that we don't have to work with the square root sign. The point that minimizes distance will also minimize distance squared. Since we know that x, y, z has to lie on this plane, we know that x has to equal 6 plus 2y minus 3z. So plugging that into this equation for distance, we get the distance squared is 6 plus 2y minus 3z squared plus y minus 1 squared plus z minus 1 squared. And this is our function of two variables, y and z, that we want to minimize. So let's find the critical points. f sub y is given by 2 times 6 plus 2y minus 3z times 2, using the chain rule, plus 2 times y minus 1 times 1. Now we could have also taken the derivative after first multiplying this out. I just find this a little bit easier to do it this way. If we simplify here, we get 24 plus 8y minus 12z plus 2y minus 2, which works out to 22 plus 10y minus 12z. We can do a similar computation to find f sub z, which is twice 6 plus 2y minus 3z times negative 3 plus twice z minus 1 times 1, which simplifies to negative 36 minus 12y plus 18z plus 2z minus 1, sorry, minus 2, which is minus 38 minus 12y plus 20, I'm not supposed to say 20z. Now we need to set f sub y and f sub z to be 0. So 0 equals 22 plus 10y minus 12z, and 0 equals minus 38 minus 12y plus 20z. Solving these system of linear equations is kind of a pain, but after you carry it out, you get that y equals 2 sevenths, z equals 29 fourteenths. And then if you plug back in 
to this top equation for x, you get that x has to equal 5 fourteenths. And if you, this gives us our candidate point 5 fourteenths, 2 sevenths, 29 fourteenths. Let's check that this critical point actually gives us a minimum by evaluating the discriminant, which in this case is f sub y, y, f sub z, z, minus f sub y, z squared. Since f sub y, y is 10, and f sub z, z is 20, and f sub y, z is negative 12, we know that the discriminant is going to be 10 times 20 minus, minus 12 squared, which is 56, which is greater than 0. And since f sub y, y at the point that we're talking about, or actually everywhere, is also greater than 0, we know that we have a local minimum. And we've minimized distance, and if we plug in the point x, y, z into our equation for distance, we actually get the minimum distance, which turns out to be 5 over the square root of 14. Next, we're going to talk about absolute maximums and minimums. Remember in calculus 1, if f is a continuous function and a, b is a closed interval, then f of x must achieve a, its maximum and minimum value on that closed interval. Now, the maximum value of f occurs at either a critical point in the interior of the interval or at one of the endpoints, a or b. We want to extend the same idea to functions of two variables. Here are a few examples of sets in the xy plane. I have the interior of a disk. That just means the inside of a circle. The dotted line means the boundary is not included. Here I have all points to the northeast of a slanted line. The straight line means the border here is included. Here I have a disk with the border included. A rectangle with the border included. And finally, a strip with the border not included. Let me number these, or letter them. and give you a couple of informal definitions. A closed set is one that contains all of its boundary points. So in our examples, B, C, and D are supposed to contain their boundary points. That's why the border is drawn solid. Whereas A and E do not contain their boundary points, they're not closed. A bounded set is one that's contained inside some large disk. So in our examples, a, C, and D are bounded. If you think about what domains you would expect a function to achieve its maximum minimum on, a continuous function, you might say C and D and you'd be correct. For A, the function might not achieve a maximum because it might keep getting bigger, bigger and bigger as you go towards this boundary that's not included. And for B and E, the function might not include its maximum because it might get bigger and bigger as you go off towards infinity in one direction or another. So to, for a continuous function to be guaranteed to achieve a maximum and minimum, you need to have a closed bounded set. And that's the extreme value theorem for functions of two variables. Same thing for functions of more variables. If f is a continuous 
function on a closed bounded set D, then F attains at least one absolute maximum and absolute minimum. I say at least one because there might be a tie. And this absolute max and min have to, has to occur at critical points or on the boundary of D. So in order to find the absolute maximum and minimum, what we need to do is find the extreme values Sorry, I'm having trouble learning how to do this. use this mouse pad. Find the extreme values of F on the boundary of D, which is written partial D, and also check the critical points. And then we just need to compare the values of F on from one and two. Let's do an example. So let's find the absolute max and min of the function given on the triangular region, which I'll draw over here. So this triangular region has three sides, a top, a right side, and a slanted side. And we'll need to check for extreme values on all three of those sides, as well as in the interior. To look for extreme values in the interior, let's find the critical points. So f sub x is 2x minus 2y, and f sub y is minus 2x plus 2. If we set both of those to 0, we get immediately from the second equation that x has to equal 1, and therefore, from the first equation, we know that y has to equal 1 also. So our critical point here is 1, 1, but notice that that point's not inside the region that we're interested in. So we don't have to worry about it. Next, let's check the boundary of D. Let's start with the top edge, where y equals 2, and x is in between 0 and 3. So we're looking at points of the form f of x2, which plugging in to our equation for f, that gives us x squared minus 4x plus 4. Now I need to find the extreme values of this function. So looking at the derivative, 2x minus 4, and setting that to 0 gives us a candidate point where x equals 2, and of course y still equals 2. So the point 2, 2 is a candidate for an extreme value. Let's just check the value of f at that point. f of 2, 2 is equal to 0. Now to find the extreme values here on the interval from x equals 0 to 3, we also want to check the endpoints of that interval. So if we look when x equals 0 and y is still 2 and check f of 0, 2, we get a value of 4. And if we look at the other endpoint at 3, 2, f of 3, 2 is equal to 1.
So those are also candidates for our extreme values. I'm just going to rewrite my function right here so I'll be able to see it as I scroll down. Okay, let's check the next piece of boundary, which is the right edge where x equals 3 and y is between 0 and 2. Remember our picture of our region. Okay, so now we're looking at f for points of the form 3y. When we plug that in, we get 9 minus 6 y plus 2y, which is 9 minus 4y. Well, that linear function has its extreme values on its endpoints. So let's check those endpoints where x is 3 and y is 0. We have f of 3, 0 is equal to 9. And the other endpoint, which is when x is 3 and y is 2, we already did that above right here. So we already considered that. Don't have to do it again. Finally, we have the slanted piece of boundary. So let's parametrize that diagonal line by x equals 3t, y equals 2 minus 2t. Plugging that in to the definition of f, we get 3t squared minus 2 times 3t times 2 minus 2t plus 2 times 2 minus 2t. That simplifies to 21t squared minus 16t plus 4. And if we try to find the extreme values of that by taking the derivative, we get 42t minus 16 equals 0. So t is going to be 8 over 21, which corresponds to an x value of 8 sevenths just plugging into the equation for x, a y value of 26 21sts. And if we calculate f on those two crazy numbers, we get a value of 20 21sts. Okay, so now we've got us look at the boundary points again for this line, but we've already considered both of those boundary points, so we don't have to consider them again. So I think we've got all the candidates for the maximum and minimum values, and just comparing those values, we can see that the maximum value is 9 Sorry, my pen's really not working. And the minimum value it looks like is uh, zero here. Okay. That's the end of our video for section 14.7. There'll be another video for 14.8.